Hey everyone, happy Friday. Welcome to another episode of First Chapter Friday. I'm super excited to bring you the story Refugee this week, written by Alan Gratz. This story is about three young refugees that take on some pretty treacherous journeys in order to get to the, the safety that they and their families need for them to be able to survive. Hopefully, as we continue these weeks of First Chapter Fridays, the word refugee is becoming more and more familiar to you, as the main character in A Long Walk to Water is going to be a refugee. We've talked about the Lost Boys of Sudan, also refugees. And then we also had, um, two weeks ago, our First Chapter Friday, the breadwinner was about Parvana, who becomes a refugee as well. So the main point is hopefully we're able to see that refugees um, come from all different places in the world and they end up in all different places in the world. Um, there's there's no just one, this is where refugees are from and this is where they end up. They, they travel all around. There's a lot of uncertainty in their lives. And this particular story not only gives us the story of one refugee, but three. So we have three main characters in this story. The first one is Joseph. He is a young man, a Jewish young man who lives in Nazi Germany in 19, in the 1930s. So we get a little bit of his story. Um, his family's kind of torn apart right away. Um, and it's their survival of, of leaving Nazi Germany. The second main character is Isabel. She is a Cuban young lady um, who lives in Cuba in 1994. There's a lot of uh, political unrest in Cuba in 1994. So her and her family make the decision that they are going to leave their homeland and travel to America. So they do so by, by getting into a raft and trying to row from Cuba to America. So, um, you know, by default, that alone right there is is a challenging journey. Our third character is Mohammed. Mohammed is from Syria. He lives in the year of 2015, so five very short years ago. His story is about how his family has to decide if they're going to stay in Syria or leave Syria. Um, and since this one is a little bit closer to us in terms of time, like we were all alive during that time period in, in, in 2015, um, you might have been familiar with some of the, the news stories that were coming out of Syria. Um, but Syria was being attacked by their own citizens, as well as people that were like from countries that were surrounding Syria. So a lot of Syrian refugees had to make the call. Do they stay or do they go? And in this case, um, Mohammed's family is going to decide to leave and they're going to emigrate into a European country. So there's a lot of traveling um, in all three stories. And it's, and it's interesting to see that even though each chapter is from a different point of view, um, how those points of view kind of come together in the end and how those stories link up. So um, I feel like if you really enjoy the first chapter that we're going to read today, that you should stick with it and you should try reading this story all the way through because the ending is worth it. I promise you that. Um, everybody loves a good twist ending or an unexpected ending, and this is definitely one of those stories that gives us that. So before we get started with chapter one today, make sure that you have all of your doodle materials ready. You've got your piece of paper, you've got whatever doodling tools you're using today. Um, in the 9-11 the story, I had some fantastic drawings where it was clear that you put a lot of time and effort and energy into your drawings. I had drawings um, that were done on the computer, that they were done on paper. They were colorful. They had lots of elements. There was It was just quickly looking at that doodle. I knew exactly what story this was, this was referencing. So I really appreciated the, the quality of the submissions that I had from that week. And not to be outdone, I had quite a few entries that were um, paragraphs. They, they were just expressing their thoughts and feelings. And, and I really appreciated hearing your thought process as well. So if you are one of those people where you're just not feeling a doodle this week and you would just really like to talk about what you're hearing or have some um, um, reactions or questions about what you're hearing, please consider doing that as well. Or maybe you're feeling a little bit of both and you wanna do a little doodle and you wanna do a little writing. I've seen that as well. 
and some people have gotten very creative. So I can't wait to showcase your work. Um, I've been posting some work on our class tag page, which is where all of our parents receive your communication about what we've been doing in class. So I'd love to share your work with them again this week. I'm very much looking forward to that. So at this point, we're gonna go ahead and get started reading chapter one. If you do not have your doodle materials, hit pause now, so that way you don't miss out on any of the story. If you have your supplies, let's do this. So um, again, on our screen today, you're looking at the front cover of the story, Refugee, which we are gonna be reading the first chapter of today. The first chapter is from Joseph's point of view. As a reminder, he lives in Nazi Germany in 1930s. The year is going to be specifically in this section, 1938. So we are in Berlin, which is the capital of Germany. Um, and here we go. This is going to be a very fast paced start. So get those pencils ready, get those doodle minds going, and let's go ahead and get started. So here's chapter one of Refugee by Alan Gratz. This is Joseph from Berlin, Berlin Germany in 1938. Crack. Bang! Joseph Landau shot straight up in bed, his heart racing. That sound. It was like someone had kicked the front door in. Or had he dreamed it? Joseph listens, straining his ears in the dark. He wasn't used to the sounds of this new flat, the smaller one he and his family had been forced to move into. They couldn't afford their old place, not since the Nazis told Joseph's father he wasn't allowed to practice law anymore because he was Jewish. Across the room, Joseph's little sister Ruth was still asleep. Joseph tried to relax. Maybe he'd just been having a nightmare. Something in the darkness outside his room moved with a grunt and a shuffle. Someone was in the house. Joseph scrambled backward on his bed, his eyes wide. There was a shattering sound in the next room. <sharp inhale> Ruth woke up and screamed, screamed in sheer blind terror. She was only six years old. Mama, Joseph cried, Papa. Towering shadows burst into the room. The air seemed to crackle around them like static from a radio. Joseph tried to hide in the corner of his bed, but shadowy hands snatched at him grabbed for him. He screamed even louder than his little sister, drowning her out. He kicked and flailed in a panic, but one of the shadows caught his ankle and dragged him face first across his bed. Joseph clawed at his sheets, but the hands were just too strong. Joseph was so scared he wet himself, the warm liquid spreading through his nightclothes. No, Joseph screamed, no. The shadows threw him to the floor, Another shadow picked up Ruth by the hair and slapped her. Be quiet, the shadow yelled, and it tossed Ruth down on the floor beside Joseph. The shock shut Ruth up, but only for a moment. Then she wailed even harder and louder. Hush, Ruthie, hush, Joseph begged her. He took her in his arms and wrapped her in a protective hug. Hush now. They cowered together on the floor as the shadows picked up Ruth's bed and threw it against the wall. Crash! The bed broke into pieces. The shadows tore down pictures, pulled drawers from their bureaus, and flung clothing everywhere. They broke lamps and light bulbs. Joseph and Ruth clung to each other, terrified and wet-faced with tears. The shadows grabbed them again and dragged them into the living room. They threw Joseph and Ruth on the floor once more and flicked on the overhead light. As Joseph's eyes adjusted, he saw the seven strangers who had invaded his home. Some of them wore regular clothes, white shirts with the sleeves rolled up, gray slacks, brown wool caps, leather work boots. More of them wore the brown shirts and red swastika armbands of Adolf Hitler's stormtroopers. Joseph's mother and father were there too, lying on the floor at the feet of the brown shirts. Joseph, Ruth, Mama cried when she saw them. She lunged for her children, but one of the Nazis grabbed her nightgown and pulled her back. Aaron Landau, one of the brown shirts, said to Joseph's father, you have continued to practice law despite the fact that Jews are forbidden to do so under the Civil Service Restoration Act of 1933. 
For this crime against the German people, you will be taken into protective custody. Joseph looked at his father panicked. This is all a misunderstanding, Papa said. If you just give me a chance to explain. The brown shirts ignored Papa and nodded at the other men. Two of the Nazis yanked Joseph's father to his feet and dragged him toward the door. No, Joseph cried. He had to do something. He leapt to his feet, grabbed the arm of one of the men carrying his father and tried to pull him off. Two more of the men jerked Joseph away and held him as he fought against them. The brown shirt in charge laughed. <laughs> Look at this one, he said, pointing to the wet spot on Joseph's nightclothes. The boys peed himself. The Nazis laughed and Joseph's face burned hot with shame. He struggled in the men's arms trying to break free. I'll be a man soon enough, Joseph told them. I'll be a man in six months and 11 days. The Nazis laughed again. Six months and 11 days, the brown shirt said. Not that he's counting. The brown shirt suddenly turned serious. Perhaps you're close enough that we should take you to a concentration camp too, like your father. No, Mama cried. My son is just 12. He's just a boy. Please don't. Ruth wrapped herself around Joseph's leg and wailed. Don't take him. Don't take him. The brown shirt scowled at the noise and gave the men carrying Aaron Landau a dismissive wave. Joseph watched as they dragged Papa away to the sounds of Mama's sobs and Ruth's wails. Don't be so quick to grow up, boy, the brown shirt told Joseph. We'll come for you soon enough. The Nazis trashed the rest of Joseph's house, breaking furniture and smashing plates and tearing curtains. They left as suddenly as they had come, and Joseph and his sister and mother huddled together on their knees in the middle of the room. At last, when they had cried all the tears they could cry, Rachel Landau led her children to her room, put her bed back together, and hugged Joseph and Ruth close until morning. In the days to come, Joseph learned that his family wasn't the only one the Nazis had attacked that night. Other Jewish homes and businesses and synagogues were destroyed all over Germany. And tens of thousands of Jewish men were arrested and sent to concentration camps. They called it Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass. The Nazis hadn't said it with words, but the message was clear. Joseph and his family weren't wanted in Germany anymore. But Joseph and his mother and sister weren't going anywhere. Not yet. Not without Joseph's father. Mama spent weeks going from one government office to another, trying to find out where her husband was and how to get them back. Nobody would tell her anything, and Joseph began to despair that he would never see his father again. And then, six months after he'd been taken away, they got a telegram. A telegram from Papa. He'd been released from a concentration camp called Dachau, and only on condition that he leave the country within 14 days. Joseph didn't want to leave. Germany was his home. Where would they go? How would they live? But the Nazis had told them to get out of Germany twice now, and the Landau family wasn't going to wait around to see what the Nazis would do next. And that's the end of chapter one and the first piece of Joseph's story in 1930s Nazi Germany. I hope I intrigued you enough to make you want to keep reading. This is also a story on Epic Library. It is an audiobook. I have assigned it to you and se or sent it to you in your mailbox just in case you wanted to learn what happens next with Joseph or maybe learn about Isabel and Mohammed. Hopefully you also had plenty to draw or write about from this first chapter as it was a very action-packed scene with a lot of emotions. Thanks for watching our latest episode of First Chapter Friday. I can't wait to see some of you as we return to school next week. Bye for now.